Come on, back out here live once again. Where? In aquaponics paradise, bringing you the heat, flames, and the fire. You know how we do it, man. I feel great today. Today's a, it's a little bit cloudy, but I don't give a freak. I'm ready to talk some tilapia right now. And some of you may know tilapia is my favorite fish. Favorite fish to raise, favorite fish to eat, favorite fish to look at. It's just overall just my favorite fish. So I want to talk a little bit about tilapia today. We're going to go over some of the, a little bit of the history, a little bit of the classification, and at the end we'll touch on the pros and cons of raising tilapia. So before we jump into our discussion, I need to take a breath. Woo! I'm pumped right now. Let's get it. So some of you may know, may or may not know that tilapia are endemic or they're native to the continent of Africa. Pretty much all the regions of Africa, um, with exceptions to maybe the northern part of Africa, is where they're native to. So they're a tropical fish. You can also find them in um, the Jordan Valley, which is that area which is just where the water just comes out south of the, um, the Sea of Galilee and then uh, trickles all the way down just north of the Dead Sea. So that area right in between there, you can find tilapia that are native to that area too. But primarily they are a native species to, uh, to the African continent. Now, there's fossils that have been found on tilapia that date back to around 18 million years ago. There's some people that will say that tilapia is like a man-made fish that's been put together in a laboratory. And that is absolutely not the truth, ladies and gentlemen. And we can also um, know that that is not the truth because we have depictions on the, uh, the walls of Egypt that show depictions in the hier hieroglyphs of uh, tilapia that are on the walls. And that dates back to around 5,000 years ago. So if they put it on there around 5,000 years ago, they've ob obviously been culturing them uh, prior to that. So we know that tilapia is not a laboratory fish. Now, do they do genetic modifications to the fish? You know, uh, most likely, yes. There are genetic modifications that are being done to the fish for various reasons, which we'll probably touch on in another video. But there, in that sense, yes. But other than that, other than that, they are a natural species to the planet. So I want to get that understood first. Now let's jump into the taxonomy or the classification of uh, the uh, important tilapia species. So we know that there's over 70 species of known tilapia that have been found. But out of the 70 species, there's only about eight or nine of these things that are really commercially viable, that we even use on a commercial scale or even on a practical scale. You know, and those reasons may vary, probably because some of those other tilapia, they probably don't grow fast enough, might not be as hardy, but there's really only, you know, eight or nine species. It could be more now, but from the research that I've uh, looked into, it's only around eight or nine of them. What you doing, man? Can I help you with something? Can I help you with something, my man? Now, before I got interrupted, um, there's only about eight or nine of them. And the, out of these eight or nine, they're broken down pretty much into two uh, genera by a woman by the name of Dr. Ethelwyn uh, Triwavas. And she did this in the 1970s. That's when it pretty much began. Prior to that, all the tilapia species were grouped into one genus called tilapia. But she came along and she divided them or separated them into separate genus, primarily due to the reproductive habits that they display. So the two important genera we're going to discuss right now, one of them is Sarathrodon. And like I said, these two uh, genus are separated by the reproductive habit. So Sarathrodon, I think that's how you pronounce it. It could be another pronunciation, but that's what it looks like. Sarathrodon, uh, this group of uh, uh, tilapia is classified as being biparental um, mouth brooders, meaning that the female and the male both incubate or could incubate uh, the, um, the offspring, the eggs in the mouth. They tumble them in their mouths when you see tilapia um, in, during the incubation process. So the mother and the father, this is a species of tilapia or a, a, a genus of tilapia that do that. And under this genus, you have um, the black chin tilapia and also you have the Galilee tilapia. These two uh, fall under that biparental uh, mouth brooders. Now, you may recognize some of these or you may not, but 
I'm pretty sure if some of you guys who raised tilapia, you will recognize some that are in the next genus of tilapia, which is Oreochromis. Oreochromis, their sexual reproductive habits are slightly different. This is when Dr. Triwava, she separated these in 19, I believe it's 1983 in her literature. She separated these. These are only maternal mouth brooders. So Papa, he doesn't have anything to do with these. Poppy has to go to the side. He, got, he comes, he does his thing. He um, fertilizes the eggs, but mommy picks them up and then she goes ahead and she incubates them and rotates them. It's just basically tumbling them in the mouth when you see them uh, incubating them. So these are the separate species right here. And in Oreochromis, you have um, Mozambique tilapia. Some of you guys may be familiar with that. Uh, Oreochromis mozambicus. You have uh, the Nile tilapia, um, which is Oreochromis niloticus. And this is the most, pretty much the most important species or the most relevant species of tilapia that's used commercially because this thing grows rapid. It's fast. Not tilapia grows fast. It grows pretty fast. So that is a huge thing when it comes to, uh, on a commercial level. Rapid growth equals rapid money for those guys. So that's another one on there. Then you have uh, blue tilapia, which is Oreochromis uh, uh, aureus, I believe. Yeah, aureus. Um, and this is what I use here. I like the blue tilapia. I can't even lie to you. I like non tilapia too. But I like blue tilapia because they're a little bit more cold hardy. So they can, you know, they can survive better in the colder temperatures because I'm in a subtropical climate right now. I'm not in a tropical climate, so heating is required here. It gets below the, um, the temperature where tilapias, you know, where they, where they uh, are uh, used to being in. So if it was a tr tropical climate, I probably would be having more Nile tilapia. But you know, these guys are, um, they work for this environment. Also, what you have is Zanzibar tilapia. That's another one of them in there that you have. You also have uh, white tilapia, which is a, a hybrid species. The white tilapia is, um, it's a hybrid of either Mozambique or the Zanzibar uh, mixed with the Nile or the blue. So you can cross, you know, you can kind of cross these guys to get this uh this white tilapia then you also have the red tilapia which is also a hybrid species as well and that's a mixture up oh, i got those wrong the red tilapia is a mixture of the mozambique and the, um the zanzibar and uh, crossed with the blue tilapia and the nile tilapia the white tilapia is a hybrid of the nile and the blue tilapia how to get that I had that confused real quick and you can read more about this in a book called Tilapia, uh, Biology, Culture, and Nutrition by, um, what's this guy's name? Uh, Krom Lim and Carl D. Webster. Those are the editors of that book. I believe it's on page three. You can check that out in there where they break that down. So these are pretty much the, um, the Oreochromis genus. And out of these, these are where the, where the most prominent species of tilapia are going to be at. The Mo Mozambique, sometimes they'll be used. Some of you guys may have those. Now tilapia and blue tilapia, those are probably the two, I have it that way, the two uh, most, mostly used uh, tilapia, you know, pretty much worldwide. So that's what we have right there. So that's a quick breakdown. Now, like I said, prior to that, I want to make sure I put this in there too. Prior to that, to Dr. Triwavas breaking these down and separating these, they were all into one group. You had a guy by the name of Dr. Phi Andriadis or something like that. He was a hater. He said he didn't want to lump them. He didn't want to separate them. He wanted to keep them lumped in there all together. He was hating on my girl, Dr. Chihuahuas. But eventually, and, that, and this was a North American position up until about 2004, when they eventually, North America eventually came to the, um, the classification of what Dr. Chihuahuas presented. She was over there in uh, Britain. She was a um, ichthyologist or a fish specialist or a fish scientist for the British Museum of Natural History. So she was on that part of the world. North America didn't want to accept it. He was hating. Some people just be hating. So he was one of them. But eventually, like I said, they came to accept the classification. But in 2013, they did another reclassification of the tilapia species where they did some other reorganization. They, tilapia species was still, as, it was, or tilapia was still its own genus. And then you had Sarathrodon, and then you had um, Oreochromis. 
they took the species that were in tilapia or the uh, that were in the tilapia genus and they separated those so they did some extra mixtures in 2013 which we're not going to touch on right now but the most important ones and the most relevant ones are in the serothrodon and the oreochromis so with that being said let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of raising my favorite fish tilapia the first pro is and this is not in any order i just want to discuss it so they're not in any any particular order but the first one is its palatability it is palatable it is a tasty fish my favorite fish i don't know about you but it's my favorite fish to eat the first time i ate tilapia was back in 2007 i was 19 at the time 31 now for some of you guys doing the, the, the calculation save you some time so uh, i was working at a place called speed code doing oil changes and my partner his his older brother worked there too it was a bunch of us we all worked there this is north las vegas um we all worked in the in, in this in this uh speed code oil change place he came in one day off a of break and he had he had a, a plate in a little plastic container and he was like letting it, letting people have a little sample of what he had i took a piece of it man and i ate it i'm like man what is this he said man this is tilapia man i said i eating some more of it man i'm like this is fire i said you got to take me to go get this right now i said why i never heard of this before he said i don't know man i said i never heard about this before i've been eating catfish the whole time i said you got to take me over there right now so we went over there to the west side it's the west side of vegas we drove over there to a place called sunny's market on lake mead and inglestead some of you guys y'all don't know that i'm not from the country i'm actually from the city some of you guys may not know that you may or may not know that but i'm from the city i'm not from the country i'm from the inner city so going over there we went to the west side of vegas and there's a place called sunny i walked in there this is my first time going there walked in there uh asian dude and a middle eastern dude up in there deep frying like no other hand one hand here one hand here on fryers i'm like woo! what is this man uh and and they had it on the menu right there tilapia with some fries i said give me that i need it. i need this tilapia man give me that so he gave me the fries and it was cheap too it was on like five bucks for a big platter of it big plate of it and um i finished that meal man i must have sucked my fingers for like three days straight i couldn't believe how good that tilapia was and that was in 2007 after that i have never eaten catfish since then that tilapia was on fire so I'm telling you that right now. It was straight fire. I never forget that. So that was the first time I ate that. And I'm going to go back there too, probably and test it out again. I think they changed the name. I think it's something else like Sammy's Market or something. They changed the name of it. But I haven't been back there in years. So I'm going to go back there again whenever I get a chance to go back. But um, that's the first thing, the palatability of it. A lot of people like tilapia. It has a mild taste. It's something that you can bake, you can fry, you can grill. You can do all kinds of things with it. Put some lemon on there. You do all type of things with it. So uh, I love tilapia. So that is a pro of raising tilapia. Now let's get into some of the growing or the raising it, the actual raising of it. That's the end product of it. Let's get into some of the actual raising of it. The, um, another pro of raising tilapia is that it is disease resistant. It is rare to find disease when it comes to tilapia. These guys are hardy. Sometimes you'll come out with disease. It does happen but it's on a rare occasion. I've, I've never had a full colony of tilapia break out with a disease. I have some here and there that will catch a disease and a lot of them even will recover without any antibiotics, without any treatment, they'll recover. These guys are something else, man. I'm trying to tell you, these guys are the real deal. So they're hardly, um, they're very resistant to disease. Um, other than that, they are very suitable for tank culture. And that's very important very suitable for tank culture um they could they take up all the areas of the water column if you can see them right now i believe that let me see if they're doing it right now you can see it right now they take up the lower the middle and the top portion of the water column they they distribute evenly in there it's just extremely important also uh what they do is they take like i said they take up all of the uh the water column or the all of the areas in the water column and you can also stock these things at a high density without really compromising their growth rates. So they're very suitable for tank culture. One of the, I think the most suitable. 
that I've seen. There may be some that are up there with them, but these guys take up the, the, um, uh, the entire water column and they're very, very suitable for it. As opposed to something like catfish, which likes to dwell on the bottom. They like to dwell on the bottom. So that's another thing that's important. Another very important pro of raising tilapia is that they are user friendly, resistant to poor water quality. So a lot of people who are new to raising fish, these guys are gonna give you a lot of leeway. You can have poor water quality and these guys are still gonna get in there and survive. You might have slight deaths here and there, but you can really push the limit if you're like someone who's just learning. You can really push the limit on tilapia. You can, they can be raised in you know, somewhat high ammonia levels, somewhat high nitrite levels, carbon dioxide levels could be uh, pretty high, actually higher than average, and they will sustain. They can sustain themselves and survive. So that is a huge benefit of raising tilapia. If you're someone who doesn't have you know, any experience, you can get your hands on some tilapia and then that will be able to let you tweak things out while you raise and build up your experience uh, growing with aquaponics. So those are some of the benefits of growing tilapia. Now let's type, uh, talk about the con. I don't want to say cons, I'm going to say con. The con of growing tilapia. Because I really only have one. There, there's probably more if I sit down, sit down and think about it, but really is one major one, and that is they do not do well in low temperatures. They can't survive that well. So when it starts getting below, um, really in the 50s, 50 degrees, that's when pretty much you're gonna start seeing deaths. Their metabolism starts to decrease. You know, you start getting around 68 degrees. I think that's around 20, uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's around 21 degrees Celsius, I, I believe. Um, you start getting down there, you start seeing the, the feeding levels, uh, the feeding rates begin to decrease. They don't feed as much. Right now, I think my temperature, I, I got a heater on, it's, it's heated. So the temperature still right now, because it's kind of cold, it's still right now around 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and they don't feed as much right now. So that means if you're not feeding as much, you got to input more heating devices in order to keep up with maximum production. So that's one of the, the cons of using tilapia. So it probably won't be as suitable if you're in a colder climate. You probably want to try a different type of uh, species. But if you're in a warmer climate, like here, subtropical or tropical climate, they do good for the vast majority of the months, but when it starts getting towards the winter months, you know, they don't really do as well. So that is the, the major con of raising tilapia. So with that being said, hopefully you guys got, have got a, um, a clear understanding on a quick, a quick understanding of a, the history, you know, a little bit of the taxonomy and some of the pros and cons of raising tilapia. Overall, these fish are the real deal. If, you have, if you're in the right climate for them, they're gonna serve you right. They're, in, they're, they're the right species. If you're in a colder climate, then you, you probably have to be better off doing something else, trying something else. So hopefully you guys has got a, a good understanding. We might break down some more things with tilapia, but um, we'll see from here. But with that being said, this is Brooklyn, St. Michael with the School of Aquaponics, reminding you to stop walking and get you some tilapia. <laughs>